This is a review of hand infections. We'll first start with the most common organisms, which is often on many questions. And the most common organisms in the hand are Staph aureus as well as beta hemolytic strep. Up to 60% of hand infections are Staph aureus. You do also need to consider gram-negative bacteria, mycobacterium, or fungal organisms when you are taking cultures at the time of surgery. Certain types of injuries, particularly farm injuries and animal bites, are polymicrobial greater than 50% of the time, as well as patients with a history of immunocompromised status. MRSA is becoming much more prevalent, particularly in hand infections. Certain organisms are common for certain kinds of wounds, such as Eichenella in human bites and Pasteurella in animal bites, particularly cats and dogs. However, Staph aureus and beta hemolymphic strep do remain most common. You also need to consider chronic infections, which often can be caused by fungus or atypical mycobacteria. Cellulitis is an infection of the skin and subcutaneous tissue, and there is no abscess or fluid collection. If it is caught early, it can be treated with oral antibiotics. Splinting, which is a mainstay of all infections to allow the soft tissues to rest, and elevation. If a patient presents with a prior oral antibiotic trial and did not have improvement, or they present with lift meningitis, which is erythematous streaking, this often requires IV antibiotics. We will start distally with our infections, and a paronychia is an infection of the nail fold. As seen in this picture to the right, you can see visible purulence underneath the epinychial fold. Sometimes this can track all the way around the entire nail fold. Staph aureus is the most common with other common organisms listed here on the bottom left. If this is caught early such that there is no visible purulent material and there's just erythema and tenderness along the epinychial fold, it can be treated with oral antibiotics and warm soaks. However, when there is visible pus in a subacute situation, this often requires drainage. This can be performed with a hypodermic needle, a scalpel, or a freer run underneath the epinychial fold, or with a small cutback along the epinychial fold. If one presses on the nail plate and there is a visible fluid wave, this often indicates that there is purulent material underneath the nail plate, which can be removed or a portion of the nail plate removed to allow adequate decompression. A chronic paronychia or nail plate Infection is often caused by fungal organisms, such as trichophyton or candida. But you also need to consider atypical mycobacteria and gram-negative bacteria as well. Even with a presumptive fungal infection, these can become super-infected with bacterial infections. Sometimes this can be treated with a topical anti-fungal agent if it just involves the nail plate. However, if there is chronic induration and separation of the nail fold, Often the nail plate needs to be removed or even a marsupialization procedure to adequately allow the germinal matrix to be decompressed. Next we will talk about the felon, which is a subcutaneous abscess involving the pole space. This is a poorly compliant compartment and it has multiple septa. This often has a preceding penetrating trauma and if left untreated, it can invade the bone, cause skin necrosis, or invade the flexor tendon sheath. Staph aureus is the most common, with MRSA becoming much more common, and therefore when you are treating this, you should start coverage with a broad spectrum antibiotic to cover for MRSA, such as Bactrim, and then tailor based on your antibiotics sensitivities. There are multiple incisions that have been described for a felon. The most typical is a midaxial incision. Midaxial incisions lie dorsal to a midlateral incision as depicted on the cartoon on the top. Going to volar would put neurovascular structures at risk. You also do not want to extend proximal to the DIP flexion crease because that runs the risk of inoculating the flexor sheath. Once you're left through the skin, you could spread with a hemostat around the volar aspect of the distal phalanx and break up all the fibrous septa to fully dis decompress the pulp space. Often, 
you go where the purulence is most visible. If it is equal, you should go on the non-dominant side of the digit, such as the radial side for the ring and small finger, and on the ulna side for the index and middle finger. After it is irrigated, you could pack the wound with some packing strips, followed by soak starting at 24 hours, as well as oral antibiotics. Patient be, should be followed up promptly to make sure that this is not getting worse. Herpetic, herpetic Whitlow is caused by the herpes simplex virus 1 and 2. In children, it is typically virus 1, and in adults, virus 1 and 2. Certain occupations where their hands are in patients' mouths, such as dental hygienists, are prone to this. There are often clear vesicles, and they can coalesce to ulcerate. They can become super infected with bacterial infections. Incision is contraindicated. However, if you need to confirm the diagnosis with a zinc smear, you can unroof the blister and culture the fluid. There's a high recurrence rate, and it is often treated with acyclovir and a dry dressing. To understand the deeper infections, we need to just review some hand anatomy and the flexor tendon sheets, so ligamentous tubes that enclose the deep flexor tendons, the superficial tendons, and the FPL. Suffered a flexor tenus synovitis or pyogenic flexor tenus synovitis is an infection involving this closed tube. They can spread into the radial or ulna bursa, particularly the small finger into the ulna bursa, and the FPL into the radial bursa. The index finger can spread to the thenar space. Once again, it is clinically important to know your anatomy and which infections can extend into other spaces. 80% of the time, there is a communication of the radial and ulna bursa, which can form a horseshoe abscess and communicate through peronus space, which is between the flexor digitorum profundus tendons and the pronated quadratus. So, separative or pyogenic flexor tenus synovitis is usually caused by a direct trauma. You need to consider atypical infections in more chronic situations particularly if there is a history of marine activities. Mycobacterium can be related to fish hook injuries, and Vibrio can be oyster shucking and fish spines. Vibrio can be very aggressive and cause deep tissue necrosis. The classic signs are Carnival's cardinal signs, which include an increased flex posture of the digit, pain over the flexor sheath, severe pain with passive extension, and the sausage digit also known as fusiform swelling. If a patient presents within 24 hours of becoming symptomatic, which is rare, you can try IV antibiotics splinting and elevation. However, if there is no improvement within 24 hours, surgery is indicated. If they present greater than 24 hours from symptoms, then emergent surgical irrigation debridement should be performed. If there is no significant subcutaneous collection, you can perform a limited approach as depicted on the picture to the right on the top, with an incision decompressing A5 and another in the palm at A1. This is then followed by placing a pediatric feeding tube or a butterfly tubing to irrigate out the flexor sheath. Sometimes in more significant infections, a more extensive approach is needed, and this is performed by a mid-axial incision, which can be left open, as well as the incision over the A1 pulley. This allows you to adequately decompress the subcutaneous tissues as well, as well as performed a synovectomy of the flexor tendons in more chronic infections. The literature does not support continuous irrigation. Labs should be drawn, and if they are positive, can be followed to show improvement. How often, however, often they have poor sensitivity. Certain factors are associated with a worse outcome, and those are listed here. There is one study showing that diabetics greater than 51% of the time require a second surgical procedure. Digits with subcutaneous purulence and ischemic changes do have worse functional outcomes.
Human mites, also known as a fight bite, typically involve the third or fourth MCP joints. This is typically an open joint as the tooth violates the extensor tendon and joint capsule and can injure the metacarpal head. It requires surgical irrigation and debridement and exploration of the joint. You should leave the wound open and take great care to try to preserve the distal aspect of the sagittal bands so that there is no extensor tendon subluxation. Step Oris and beta hemolymic strep are the most common, but you also need to consider Iconella. Animal bites. Most commonly dogs, cats, or rodents. 80% are dog bites. And these have much lower chance of getting infected because of their crushing and tearing mechanism. Cat bites have a 50% infection rate. They have sharp, piercing teeth, which penetrate deeper. And because it is a smaller wound, it often gets walled off faster, forming an abscess. Pastorella multiceta is most common, but average bites often are polymicrobial. Going back to our bursa, these include the radial and ulna bursa, which can communicate in 80% of the time into the anterior forearm through Perona's space. This diagram shows the various hand deep space compartments, which include the dorsal subapneurotic space, the thenar, mid, thenar space, the midpalmar space, hypothenar space, and the web spaces. They can be due to spread from adjacent structures, such as the index finger flexor sheath communicating to the thenar space, or from a direct penetrating trauma. In order to also understand how these compartments form, we need to understand the palmar fascia, which is a triangular shaped structure, which becomes thinner over the thenar and hypothenar regions. They extend distally into four digital bands. The radial and ulnar margins of this triangular palmar fascia help divide us into the various compartments. So the medial fibrous septum, also the ulna side, extends to the fifth metacarpal, and medial to this is the hypothenar compartment. The lateral fibrous septum, or the radial side, communicates down to the third metacarpal, and lateral to this is the thenar compartment. Between the two, we will have our mid-palmar space, and there is another space that is deep to the adductor, which is the deepest muscular comp compartment. So the first deep space infection is the dorsal subapneurotic space between the extensor tendons and fascia dorsally and the metacarpals and interosseous palmally. If it involves the entire dorsum of the hand, you would make two longitudinal incisions, one between the index and third metacarpal and the other between the fourth and fifth metacarpal. You want to avoid incisions so as to not be directly over the tendons this way the wound can be left open. The thenar space is bordered medially by the vertical mid-palmar septum, which goes down to the third metacarpal, dorsally and radially by the adductor pollicis. It lies deep to the long flexor tendons of the index finger, and it communicates with the web of the thumb and underneath the flexor retinaculum. These can result from contiguous spread or penetrating trauma. They can involve both the palmar aspect of the thenar eminence and the dorsal first web space. There's often an abducted posture of the thumb. These are typically drained with a two incision approach. The volar incision is adjacent and parallel to the thenar crease and dorsally a longitudinal incision is performed. When going dorsal, you will go between the adductor and the first dorsal interosseous muscle. You want to avoid transverse incisions in the web to prevent contracture. Incisions may be loosely closed over a drain. The mid-palmar space is dorsal to the long flexor tendons of the middle ring and little fingers and palmar to the interosseous of the third, fourth, and fifth metacarpals. It is bordered radially by that mid-palmar septum going to the third metacarpal and ulnarly 
by the septum going to the fifth metacarpal. Often you will lose the normal concavity of the palm, and they will have pain on direct palpation of the palm, as well as with passive motion of the middle and ring fingers. Depicted below are the various incisions that can be performed depending on the extent of the mid palmar space infection. The hypothenar space is depicted here in green, and it involves the fascia that contains the hypothenar muscles. The adductor space is often decompressed when we do thenar space infections, but it can be its own entity, and it lies dorsal to the thumb adductor. Web space infections are also known as collar button abscesses, and often this starts as a small infected blister or open wound or a palmar callus, and often Although it starts pommelly, it does extend dorsally as depicted on the pictures to the right. Here in the cartoon on the right, you can see that extension from palmar to dorsal to involve the subcutaneous tissues. This often requires a two incision approach in the palm and dorsally. And once again, avoid transverse incisions in the web space to prevent a contracture and painful scar. Necrotizing fasciitis is a surgical emergency, often caused by group A strep. Delay in diagnosis and surgical debridement can lead to loss of life or a limb. The most common reasons for death are organ failure and sepsis. You can see here in the pictures to the right that there is subcutaneous air, and that is that crepitation you can feel on physical examination. is often non-fitting edema and significant tenderness in the extremity beyond the erythematous area. They also have vital sign changes in terms of fever, tachycardia, and hypotension, as well as vascular thrombosis. At the time of the surgery, the fat is often gray and liquefied, and is often called dishwater pus. These very often require multiple surgical debridements at 24 to 48 hour intervals, and sometimes an amputation is required to adequately gain control of the infection in order to save life. Septic arthritis can be caused by a penetrating trauma or a spread from the bloodstream or a contiguous structure. Staph aureus and beta hemic strep are the most common, but in sexually active patients, Neisseria gonorrhea needs to be considered, and in unvaccinated children, Haemophilus influenza needs to be considered. Now, when you have a patient that presents with a warm, swollen wrist, you do need to do a full history and make sure there's no history of gout or other crystalline pyrophosphate diseases. If a patient does have a history of a crystalline arthropathy and they have no reason to have an infection and are not immunocompromised, and x-rays show calcifications in the region of the TFC, often the diagnosis is a crystalline arthropathy. If a patient presents with a warm, tender area over the flexor carpial narrus, you need to consider calcific tendonitis, as this is the most common calcific tendonitis to have in the wrist. And in the digit, it's often at the terminal extensor tendon. Warm, swollen PIP joints with calcifications in the region of the collateral ligaments may be due to a forward reactive periostitis and not an infection. Joint aspiration is often performed with the criteria listed here. You also need to include gram stains with culture and crystal analysis. These are often treated with irrigation and debridement, and for the wrist you can either do it arthroscopically or a dorsal longitudinal incision with similar outcomes. For the MCP joints, a dorsal incision with preservation of the sagittal bands, and for the interphalangeal joints, a mid-axial approach is often performed, so that can be left open and not compromise any of the nerve vascular or tendinous structures. Often you will be tested on chronic hand infection as well. Although TB and Mycobacterium marinum are both mycobacterial infections, there are differences. They can both occur in the flexure sheaths. There are often rice bodies in both. TB in the hand is less common. Mycobacterium marinum often needs to be cultured at a lower temperature on Lowenstein-Jensen agar. 
And there is often a preceding history of marine activity. On pathologic slides, Mycobacterium marinum have non-caseating granulomas, and TB shows caseating granulomas. The ESR may be normal in Mycobacterium marinum infections. Other chronic hand infections include Mycobacterium leprae, and often one question is the first nerve to be affected, which is the ulna nerve in the upper limb. Cat scratch disease is caused by Bartonella infection. It is often self-limiting, and if there is concern and a diagnosis is needed, it is often performed by serology. Tularemia, common with rabbit injuries, and you get an ulcerating papule and lymphadenopathy. Actinomycosis, also known as puncher's actinomycosis because it often has to do with oral flora. Pathomonic is yellow sulfur granules that start to drain. Other chronic infections include cutaneous anthrax, often treated with a 60-day course of Cipro or doxycycline, and that is depicted on the picture to the right on the top. And ORF, which is a parapox virus, often with sheep herders, and this is often spontaneously resolved in about eight weeks. Imiquimod can shorten the healing time, and that is depicted to the right on the bottom picture. Fungal infections are often diagnosed with a KOH stain. There is cutaneous, which we talked about earlier, involving the nail. Subcutaneous, and the classic one is Sporotrix schenkii. Often the question will say the patient was working in the garden or as a florist or there was a thorn injury. So be on the lookout for those classic things in the question body. There's often multiple nodules along the lymphatics. Surgery is not needed if you can make the diagnosis. Surgery is not curative, but you can perform a biopsy to obtain the diagnosis. Deep infections often cause chronic arthritis and tenosynovitis. And listed here are the various types of deeper fungal infections. Mucromarcosis is known as a blood vessel resider and can cause skin necrosis as it invades the subdermal plexus. So just some testing tips. Read the full question before jumping to try to answer it. There's often a lot of material that you can gain from the patient's occupation or recreational activities if listed. If they have any medical history, please pay close attention to that because if they are a transplant patient, immunocompromised due to diabetes or HIV, that can tip you off to what they are looking for or the type of organism causing the infection. And also pay attention in the question to how long the patient has had the infection for, because if it is a question about how to treat, that is often related to the timing of the infection. I hope this talk helps you prepare for your boards. Good luck and stay well.